Alright, so I thought I'd do a video quick on why the Volvo 240 is actually a good enthusiast car. So there's a few reasons that really stand out to me that make it a great car uh, for daily use as well as uh, modifying and building and doing whatever you want to do to it. Um, so there's also a couple downsides, so we'll go over all of it. Um, starting with the positives. Uh, you get four wheel disc from the factory, even back in the 70s models. Uh, McPherson strut front, uh, trailing arm rear, suspension straight axle rear, it is rear wheel drive. So for that aspect, it's great. As far as modifying goes, they're very easy because they give you a lot of space and almost everything is bolt in. So this was an automatic car when I got it. And it was about a five hour swap to go to a manual. The biggest thing is just collecting all the parts. Uh, but parts availability is really good. They sold like somewhere around 2.7 million of these in the United States uh, throughout their lifetime. And a lot of the parts are interchangeable. So this, like I said, was an automatic car. And uh, now it has a M47 five speed in it. Uh, and I did that swap alone uh, in a garage with, I didn't even have jack stands. I had it on some ramps, uh, just did it on ramps. So not even a jack, but if you look, there's plenty of room for whatever you want to do in here. There's plenty of room to work on it. They're super easy to maintain all the turbo stuff from the turbo models can swap right over to this. It's all bolt in, uh, ECUs plug right in. The only thing that you need to worry about doing is drilling the block or the oil pan for an oil return for the turbo, which uh, overall is a pretty easy turbo swap. But if you look here, there's plenty of room. I've had a couple people that I know swap some giant turbos on here. The pedal box, you can just unbolt from any manual 240 in the junkyard and it bolts into an automatic car. Uh, no other modification needed other than drilling uh, one hole for the clutch cable. It is a cable clutch. So it's a very easy swap. And here's the five speed M47 with that in there. Uh, there's no modification needed for the shifter location or anything like that. Uh, it's all bolt in. Flywheel bolts on, you just have to get a pilot bearing. Uh, this is the, this is an 89. So this is a difference to mention. Uh, 87 plus cars did have better wiring harnesses. Some of the earlier ones had some harness issues and electronic issues. Uh, this is an 89. So this is Bosch LH 2.4 uh, management. Um, which has a sensor that reads off the flywheel in these models. So uh, if you are manual swapping an 89 plus that has LH 2.4, uh, you have to keep that in mind and that's the hardest bit to find is a sensor uh, flywheel. I ended up getting a lightweight flywheel. I can put a link in the description um, and that is one you can actually buy. It's around $200, which does bring the price up quite a bit. Um, easy way to tell if it's a LH 2.4 car is the onboard computer right here. This is for checking your check engine light, which has a little LED that you can read and a button to push and a little probe to clear and check codes, which is pretty nice to have. So I mentioned suspension design before. The suspension in these is very soft from the factory. It does handle pretty well considering. Um, especially in like wide, fast, like highway sweeping turns and stuff like that. Uh, once you get on some tight twisties, it does kind of loosen up a bit and it's not ideal. Uh, they do give you a ton of suspension travel though, uh, front and rear, which is one of the reasons you can haul so much with these. Um, with that, uh, it does allow you to 
cut the springs and not ride terribly. So I was on cut springs for a bit, um, two coils off the front and it handled just fine. It wasn't uncomfortable on the road uh, and it did tighten up the front a little bit, uh, which was pretty nice. Another thing to mention, so as big and long as this car is, a lot of people think they're extremely heavy because of that. But realistically, this car, we got it on some calibrated scales that were used for uh, drag race uh, weights. So on those scales, uh, this weighed, I believe just over 2,800 pounds. I'll try and find the picture. Uh, in my uh, in my phone and I'll try and put that in the video um, but 2800 pounds for a wagon that this big isn't that bad uh, another upside um, I've used this wagon as more or less a truck for the time that I've had it uh, so in the back here this is pretty heavy duty plywood in the decking here and uh, that holds quite a bit of weight. I've had a Toyota 20R um, and a uh, W50 transmission in the back. That's the Steelcase W Series Toyota transmission. Um, and it handled the weight just fine. Uh, I just put a tarp down, um, no issues. It wasn't riding on the bump stops or anything like that. Uh, definitely, you know, was riding a little bit lower, but uh, I've had multiple engines um, in the back of this thing. I also got a hitch on here, which was a one and a quarter. As far as I know, there's nowhere you can buy the two inch hitches anymore. Um, so I ended up cutting off the one and a quarter and adding my own two inch and gusseting it and reinforcing it and then repainting it. So. That can tow, I think it was rated for 3,500 pounds and a one and a quarter. Uh, I've towed at least that with this car before. I've towed my Hilux on a dolly with the back seat folded down. Uh, it's about six foot three, if I remember correctly, from the inside here where the door closes to your headroom there. So uh, the plan was to kind of use this as an autocross car actually once I got the suspension and everything done and uh, head down to the track, which is a couple hours away and uh, kind of camp in it the night before. Um, so there's plenty of room to do that. So in the cluster, you'll see there is a big analog clock here. Some of the manual models and turbo models came with a tack there. Uh, that tack actually can you can t pull this cluster out unscrew this clock and they already have a wire already ready for you to install that tack all you have to do is plug it in it's all already there and your tack will work um, that tack is getting a little hard to find and sometimes they're getting a little pricey on ebay and stuff like that so what i did was i found a bertone coupe a volvo 240 bertone coupe which had a different cluster in the junkyard and it had a small in cluster tachometer. So I took that and installed it in these two cluster, uh, two gauge pods that are factory basically. I made a little face plate for it and I just used that wire and moved it over and it runs this tack the same as it would the bigger one. So it's not in the ideal place, but it works and for the manual swap, it definitely gave me uh, more information as far as having a tack, and it's nice to have. Another upside of using a 240 as a enthusiast car, modifying it and doing whatever you want with it, uh, is the price. As of right now, you can get a sedan uh, on Craigslist or whatever for very cheap. Uh, you can get a good running car for around thousand bucks. 1500 bucks uh, that might be an auto but like I said it's really easy to swap to a manual so don't let that stop you the wagons and coupes do tend to go for a bit more money uh, the coupe is obviously gonna be the lightest configuration um, 
and they do look really good. So underneath the car, the rear straight axle is basically a Dana 30. So a lot of Jeep guys actually take the take the LSDs out of the 700 series, uh, which had a similar axle, um, and put them in their Jeeps in the front. Um, so they're out there. You can find uh, the 700 Volvo 700 series axles with LSDs out in the junkyard. So you can get an LSD in this car for around 50 bucks uh, or under even. Um, so that's a pretty easy mod to do and find. It's just hitting the junkyards and finding a car. Um, another thing to keep in mind is there is a difference in the axles uh, early versus late. Uh, I'm blanking on the information, but I think it's a 1031 axle has the reinforcement. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get it in the video, but basically there's reinforcing ribs on the front near the pinion seal of the casing and that's the later axle. Uh, so if you do pull an LSD, you do need to match your axle with the one that's in your car. Another super easy mod to find, at least for the wagons, is the uh, sedan sway bars, uh, and especially the GT, the turbo, some of the turbo cars. Um, the sedan sway bars were a thicker sway bar uh, and you can grab that off of a sedan in the junkyard and put that onto your wagon and it'll stiffen up the rear a little bit. Uh, the wagon did have stiffer springs from the factory, so that combined with the stiffer sway bar can give you a lot better handling. So one last thing I want to talk about is uh, the transmission in these. This is an M47. There's a few different models of automatic and manual transmission that will bolt right up to this engine. The M46 and M47 are the most popular uh, Volvo transmissions. The M46 is a four speed with a push button overdrive. The M47 is a true five speed. The M46, the four with an overdrive is known to hold up to a lot more power and a lot more abuse than the M47. So keep that in mind if you do plan on swapping the M47 is better for kind of a stock engine and maybe stock OE Volvo turbo parts bolted on. Uh, somewhere around 200 horse, uh, much beyond that, and you might start to have some transmission issues. The M46, on the other hand, is known to hold up to 300, 400 horse, no problem, and keep going. The automatics, the AW71 that came in this car, uh, are very strong and are known to hold up to three, four, or 500 horse, even above that, and not, not complain, not really give you any issues at all. Uh, so they're pretty burly. So this is the B230F. Uh, this engine is the NA89 engine, uh, and produces somewhere around 115 to 120 horsepower from the factory. Uh, it's not a whole lot, and a lot of you guys are probably used to more powerful cars at this point, and I was too. Um, but with a manual behind it, it's actually pretty fun to drive. You're not going to get anywhere really fast, but you're invisible to police, which is nice. Um, and it's definitely still fun to drive around. Uh, but if you do find yourself wanting more power, like I mentioned earlier, that turbo, all the turbo stuff from either the 240s or the 740s or the 940s, uh, will bolt right on and even onto this NA block. Uh, the NA block is higher compression. Uh, I believe nine and a half to one in this. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, but with that, you get more power if you add the turbo. So that's where you get the uh, B230F plus T uh, setup, which a lot of guys run. And it's with a relatively bolt on kit of all factory parts. It's pretty easy to get around 200 horse uh, at the wheels and then with some other mods, uh, whether it be a bigger turbo or aftermarket management uh, or a chip DCU, uh, it's easy to get well into the 200s, even the 300s. Uh, these stock blocks are way overbuilt and uh, 
have been known to hold three or four hundred wheel horse no problem on a stock block with a couple hundred thousand miles on it at least uh, this engine has 220k about on it and it runs super strong runs like a freshly broken in engine uh, with no signs of stopping so it's been pretty fantastic so, so the downsides of the Volvo 240 uh, one I would say is that your wheel selection is very limited uh, you're a 5x18 5 by 108 bolt pattern uh, so you're pretty much limited to Volvo wheels some other Ford wheels um, and then very small aftermarket um, so you do find yourself in a kind of tough situation if you want to run something else uh, these are Ford Crown Victoria wheels that I'm on uh, they're 5 by 114.3 so I am running bolt-on spacers uh, 32 mil bolt-on spacers so you do find yourself in that position uh, so basically these are zero offset wheels 15 by 7 plus zero and with a 32 mil spacer so I'm about at about negative 32 and uh, these cars definitely like offset fitment is pretty good doesn't really rub or anything with a good fender roll it rubbed a bit before that um, but uh, they definitely don't mind it. Another kind of downside, I suppose, is if you do find yourself needing cruise control, it might not be the best car. Uh, some of the 240 models did come with cruise control, uh, but they're very hard to find, and it's not the easiest thing to do. So uh, finding one can be a bit tough. If you can deal without the cruise, then shouldn't be an issue uh, you could also run a aftermarket cruise system a few of my cars have had it had a aftermarket cruise and it it works uh, usually not quite as well as the factory stuff but definitely uh, if you take it on long road trips can relieve your legs another downside as well as kind of an upside is the paint so this is an Arizona car the paint fades out um, some of the colors were single stage paint. Single stage paint on these Volvos holds up exceptionally well, it just kind of fades out. So with a good buff and wax, they usually look pretty nice. Uh, unfortunately, this was a dual stage uh, paint, so paint and clear. And with that, I have some clear coat peel along these doors and right on the roof and the front passenger fender as well. So that's kind of a bummer but it's an old car and that's kind of what you get. The turning radius on these Volvos is also pretty insane. I wasn't quite far enough over on that street, but in almost any two lane street, you can make a U-turn. So I thought I'd do a video quick on why the Volvo 240 is actually a good enthusiast car. So there's a few reasons that really stand out to me that make it a great car uh, for daily use as well as uh, modifying and building and doing whatever you want to do to it. Um, so there's also a couple downsides, so we'll go over all of it. Um, starting with the positives. Uh, you get four-wheel disc from the factory, even back in the 70s models. Uh, McPherson strut front, uh, trailing arm rear, suspension straight axle rear, it is rear-wheel drive. So I thought I'd do a video quick on why the Volvo 240 is actually a good enthusiast car. So there's a few reasons that really stand out to me that make it a great car uh, for daily use as well as uh, modifying and building and doing whatever you want to do to it. 
Um, so there's also a couple downsides, so we'll go over all of it. Um, starting with the positives, uh, you get four wheel disc, So I thought I'd do a video quick on why the Volvo 240 is actually a good enthusiast car. So there's a few reasons that really stand out to me that make it a great car. Uh, 